Welcome back to part two. If you've missed part one, there's a link below. One example of a better touch interface is Magic's Music Maker Jam, which has huge sliders and big buttons and works brilliantly and is a lot of fun to play with. It's not the same sort of software, you, you buy loops and you mix them all together and create instant music, uh, but it's a good example of how an interface can work really well on a touchscreen. Magic's also make the well-regarded Samplitude professional audio software, so maybe they'll be up to the task of creating the perfect multi-touch door interface. The behemoth that is the Slate Raven have also had a stab at getting around the fiddly buttons and sliders of a mouse designed interface by making an enormous screen, which makes everything far more touchable. It's a logical solution on a grand scale, but I believe the solution actually lies in software and GUI design rather than proprietary hardware. Maybe it's really hard to implement multi-touch. I don't know, it's something I don't have any idea about. However, I did discover that it's probably getting easier. One of my favorite synths is D16's Lush 101. Uh, as I was testing plugins in Sonar, I loaded it up and was completely surprised to find it was completely multi-touch. Every bit, every fader, every knob and parameter could be moved all at once. Now this is exactly what I've been after, a decent synth where I can finally move the filter cutoff and resonance about at the same time without an additional controller. Suddenly performing and messing about with the sounds becomes a whole new world. As an afterthought I loaded it up in Cubase which doesn't have touch implemented and yet the Lush 101 was still totally multi-touchable. I could even play the virtual keyboard with one hand and twiddle knobs with the other. This means that multi-touch within plugins is completely independent to multi-touch within the door. Or at least it must be. I contacted D16 about it and they had no idea it could do that, but they weren't at all surprised. The reason is that they've been using a third-party programming framework called JUICE, uh, J-U-C-E, uh, for C++, a huge part of which is visual controls. It's cross-compatible with Windows, OS X, Android and iOS, so all the touch facilities made available for the iPad get implemented into the Windows version as well. So yeah, this is the, the Lush 101. Uh, and as you can see, if I can uh, arrange my fingers right, uh, I can pick up a couple of faders and move them about. Let's stick these at the top. So it's completely multi-touch. Multi-touch on the keyboard, multi-touch on all the sliders. which finally gives you resonance and cut off at the same time, going in different directions. D16 say they didn't do it on purpose, and in fact Lush 101 isn't available on the iPad, it's just that it's built into the framework that they used. All their other plugins are multi-touch as well. How cool is that? They say they are now keen to improve the GUI to give a lot more space for touching, which would be excellent. The other choice, the possible multi-touch control messiah comes in the form of Emulator from Smiths & Martin. A few years ago, the Jazz Mutant Lima was, for me, simply sex in a touchscreen controller. Beautiful, I wanted one. When the iPad arrived, they made a very wise decision to admit that they couldn't compete in terms of hardware, so packed it all in and released it as an iPad app. Awesome. However, I've always believed that surely you could run something like that on a second screen attached to your studio desktop. Why run it on a second computer with all the cost issues and connection and latency issues? Why not have it all on one machine? Emulator is that software. I've been following their development for a couple of years and had some good conversations with them, but they did seem to drift into a bit of a trap of proprietary hardware. Multi-touch screens have not been generally available and so they released their own screen in the form of the KS1974. Uh, it's really impressive, but it's expensive. It's only got four touch points and costs well over a grand for something which looks a bit like a larger Lima that's now a 20 quid app. Their main business is in the DJ market, where they produced this futuristic looking controller which had a large screen running emulator software controlling tractor. It worked by projecting a mirror image on the back of the screen so you could see what the DJ was moving as they moved it. It looked flipping excellent and they suddenly found themselves in all sorts of demand. As a flagship product, the DVS or Dual View system is amazing. It looks wonderful on stage and gives DJs an opportunity to look like they're actually doing something, which is very cool. The problem is that the emulator software, which is available by itself, seems to be getting largely ignored. They keep promising templates that never materialize and the online documentation is a bit sketchy. Meanwhile, if you follow them on Facebook, you'll soon discover that they're all far too busy being cool at super cool superstar DJ parties. 
So you see the fabulous videos of wonderful looking software and uh, people having a really good time. And when you buy your own copy, you're faced with a big black screen. We'll get straight into the uh, the realm of ultimate darkness, which is the uh, the. Uh, there's no default project. There's no tutorial. There's no offline instructions. There's not a single example of what it could look like. You have to start from scratch. The website, which has quite a few buttons that don't actually do anything, talks about these templates and shows images of them. But I can't find the bloody things. Even the poor Besiege forum moderator seems to only have one for Tractor. Alan Smithson himself was kind enough to reply to my queries and ensured me that although life is one long series of parties, they are definitely working on it. They're working on templates, they're working on default projects, they're working on video tutorials. And in fact, a lot of my issues have been addressed in the few weeks that I've been talking to them about it. So they are definitely listening. And that's very reassuring. And even with the shortcomings, it's one piece of software that I'm going to keep on using. And in the meantime, you can download the templates that I've created from our website. Let's have a closer look. So let's get stuck into uh, the Emulator Pro. Uh, this is the main editor which is this void of darkness, of nothingness, other than a few uh, buttons at the bottom, which is this blank canvas inspiration you have to create your own controller. But it's not difficult. Bring the mouse in. Uh, uh, you right click, you've got buttons, sliders, knobs, pads, bits and pieces. You can just choose a, a slider and you can slap it on. Um, you can move it about and grab a corner make it as big as you like and it's straight away uh, touchable it's working you can work while you're editing um, copy and paste create another one like so and another one and I've now got three working faders um, slap in a knob like so make the knobs suitably huge and you can change the color that kind of thing so yeah knobs and sliders it's all there it's very it's it, it's easy to build up your own controller it doesn't take too much time um, it's it's not desperately interesting to watch though somebody else doing it uh, you have here in our in our little panel here uh, you set your MIDI parameters, a channel, the MIDI number, label, that kind of thing. There's tons of other stuff in here, but that's that's the basic of it. Create some faders, create some knobs, go control your software. Easy. Uh, it's probably a lot easier if I show you something which I made earlier. So let's load up my Cubase controller. Uh, all I've done, I've created a 16 channel um, fader, controller desk, mixer thingy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, MIDI controller. So I've got 16 faders that's working directly into Cubase. I've got pan, mute, and solo. I've got a jog wheel and uh, stop, play, things like that. And so this works uh, exactly as you'd expect it to. Like so, uh, very simple, very effective. And uh, what you can't see from over there, but if I bring you around, you'll be able to see that uh, my faders here are controlling Cubase up here. Ta -da! So as I move uh, in emulator down here, that's completely reflected uh, in Cubase. I've created and mapped a generic remote in order to do this. Uh, which again isn't difficult and you can download this from our website if you want if you have emulator you'd like to try this out yourself uh, so you've got that you've got pan see that moving at the top like so uh, mute buttons solo buttons um, transport controls my little jog wheel uh, 
<clears throat> Very easy. Uh, I've also created a couple of other pages, created an EQ page, which looks uh, enormous. Okay, so I've got uh, all my 16 channels worth of EQ set up here, four bands, as there is in Cubase. And if you bring up the editor on screen, uh, you can see it there. So I turn on different bands, that appears, and uh, you know I can move them about, change the, the bit. So I've got full control uh, over the EQ from this as well, all on multi-touch, all controlled and designed. Fantastic! You can't mess with that. Uh, the other thing I set up is a, is a synth controller here with just some larger knobs which I can map to any synth in Cubase very easily, uh, very simply. Okay, another feature of Emulator is its ability to cut bits out of itself so you can see the software through it. So I've created a few controls here just for running with uh, Resolume Avenue, which is some video software. Da, 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 da. But I want to combine these two together so I can run it on a single screen for performance. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll bring uh, Resolume Avenue down into here. If I hide Emulator, we can see it. I'll make it full screen, bring emulator back in, of course now I can't see it. Now if I can run something called, uh, press a button called transparency, now I can see um, Resolume through and, uh, and control it that way. But that's not quite what I was after, because uh, I don't want to get distracted by all those other controls and I want to be able to touch things at the moment I can't launch, I can't launch the, uh, the video loops I want to do. So what I t do is I take a shape and um, I cut a hole. I just have to put the camera down for this as I need to hold the shift button. But you should be able to see what, I, what I'm going to do. I put down a little shape like this. I move it to what, what it is I want to see. Drag it around. So in this case I'm dragging it around the clips at the top. I press the subtract button and that's now shining through properly and uh, I can now launch the clips through emulator. There's another one that I want to do so I'll get uh, my shape tool again and I'll throw this over here hit subtract and I can turn off transparency now and I've now got my preview windows and my clips shining through uh, emulator. So I've got full control and I've got my fingers can go through to select the clips. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm doing here? So emulator essentially has got uh, a hole in it. Um, I can show you what I mean even more clearly if I take Resolume away. And now you can see that I've cut holes out of the emulator software like that. Which is pretty cool. So uh, uh, yeah, bring what's it back in. And now I've got control and I can launch my clips. Pretty flipping cool! The applications are endless. 
You can set up a controller for anything you like or just part of something. Maybe there's a few tasks you do all the time. Uh, if it can be MIDI learned, then you can build a controller for it. The other thing that Emulator does is lets you think out of the box a little bit. So I've created this uh, controller. The idea being that it's more ergonomically suited to my fingers. Um, does it work or not? I don't really know, but it seemed like a nice idea. But simply because it's software and you can design whatever you like, well then why not? You know, think out of the box. It doesn't have to be all in straight lines. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about designing your own controller. You can do whatever you like. Even when Cubase and Live and Pro Tools and everybody else inevitably becomes multi-touch, it'll still be a useful bit of software for creating custom interfaces with only the controls you want at your fingertips. It feels like we're at the start of something in terms of using Windows 8 and a multi-touch screen professionally, but the potential is starting to emerge and will become more exciting as more manufacturers cotton on. We've just gone through a round of new versions, Cubase 7, Reason 7, Live 9, and the must-be-here-by-now digital performer, but it's only Cakewalk who have had the foresight so far to take a stab at this huge ball of potential. The key has to be in the GUI. The Sonar console aptly demonstrates how the existing interface doesn't always translate well to touch. Reason has its huge mixer with tiny knobs but somehow manages to feel easier to use, but you're restricted to that one finger. Live, on the other hand, lends itself quite well to touch with all the clip business and a clear layout, but it fails with the mouse emulation issue on controls. Maybe we need something like Automap that brings full-size knobs and sliders when you want to touch them, like a magnifier function that enlarges the GUI of what you're working on. Maybe Emulator is doing that already, but I imagine that getting touch integrated into the door has to be the next step. It seems bonkers to me to create proprietary hardware like the KS1974 or the alarmingly huge Slate Raven when the technology already exists at the desktop level for a few hundred quid. The iPad, for all its power and allure, can only go so far because of its size, and you've got the hassle of creating ad hoc networks at gigs in order to get control of your performance software. Having the control as part of your desktop computer, or as an extension of your laptop, using the power that's already there, fully integrated, makes much more sense to me. So, a multi-touch and, and multi-screens. Um, bringing this technology into uh, the desktop environment just makes Windows 8 so worth it. You know, it's very different to a normal OS uh, touching. It's just different. You know, it has to be. <coughs> and that's how it should be. I mean, maybe, maybe everyone is waiting for Apple. That seems quite likely. But Apple is sort of stuck. They're stuck with OS X and iOS. Uh, you know, and uh, what I've come to realise in, in using sonar and in fiddling with this stuff is that a desktop OS is not really right for touch. Um, you know, it's, it's not, it becomes an unideal place. Uh, so you can't do everything that you want to need. It becomes clumsy and awkward. Uh, so what you sort of need is some kind of hybrid, something that crosses the gap between uh, you know, giving you the detail and the versatility of the desktop with the user-friendly, accessible, fat-fingeredness of a multi-touch screen. You know, sort of a hybrid between the two, like say, well, maybe like Windows 8. Hmm. So there you have it. Uh, I'm loving it. I'm not giving my multi-touch screen back, <laughs> ever. Uh, it's a fantastic thing. So, uh, so come, and, you know, come and join in, have a go, tell us what you think. Uh, see you next time.